Hey everybody, welcome or welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Jules and uh, over the last few videos, maybe with a break in between, I have been swatching out all of the colours from this Rembrandt watercolour dot card. Dot card? <laughs> dot card. <laughs> I really love looking at colours and as you can see so far, we have been making great progress switching out all of these. And now today we are moving into these earth tones and specialty colors, which I'm so excited to share with you. Um, if you did not check out the previous two videos and you like more brighter, uh, more saturated primary colors, that may be something that interests you. And uh, if not, glad to have you here. And please do leave the uh, video a like and a comment really helps me out and I'm really enjoying the community that we're building here on this channel. Personally, I really, really love greens and muted earthy colours, so I am excited to swatch these out for us today. Um, just trying to locate the brush I wanted to use. This is my favourite brush for dot card swatching. It is a <clears throat> Da Vinci Cosmotop Spin. And I like it because it has quite a firm, uh, has quite firm bristles, so it's really good for activating the colours off of a sheet like this. I've added a drop of water onto all of these, and I have two jars of water <laughs> off to the side, unusually prepared of me. And I'm excited to get right in. On the dot chart, I have um, put the, not on the dot chart, but on my swatching page here, I've put the paint numbers, so, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about each paint as we go. So, without further ado, we're starting off with paint number 620, 620 Olive Green, which is a mixture of pigments. It is pigments uh, PG7, so phthalo green, with Nicolazo Yellow, PY150, and PV19, and it's a lovely muted olivey green, as the name suggests. <laughs> Couldn't argue with that one. I really enjoy this colour. I don't know if I would buy this particular version. Um, I think there's only so many convenience greens you can have in your palette and I probably wouldn't choose this one, but it's nice. Uh, really easy to re-wet, really transparent. And maybe you could build it up a little more in the mass tone. Yeah, this is a really, really nice olive green. Do make sure to grab yourself a drink because I expect that this will be a long, <laughs> longer video. Um, much like the, the previous editions were, uh, but it's really nice to just put on in the background while you're doing the dishes or washing the dog or whatever, and we can just hang out for a little bit and look at some colours. So the next colour is azomethene green yellow. So this was one of the colours that I bought from their student grade uh, line, which is the Van Gogh series of watercolours, and it's PY129, which is the standard sort of pigment that brands will use for a single pigment green gold. And it's a really, really nice colour. This is a really nice version of it, very vibrant. Um, I know several artists who use this as their cool yellow in their split primary mixing palette. Uh, mixes really wonderful greens, but isn't so, isn't so shockingly bright. So that was number 296, and now we're moving on to number 227, Yellow Ochre, which is a mixture of PY43 and PY42, which are respectively the... Uh, natural and synthetic versions of yellow iron oxide. Unusual for it to be a mixture, but I don't think that probably affects the performance. This is a really nice saturated uh, yellow earth tone. I try to wash these out towards the bottom so you can see how uh, transparent they are. And we'll, maybe we'll see a little bit of texture here. They don't say it's granulating, they just say it's transparent. And uh, all these colours so far have excellent light fastness as well which is important if you're producing work for sale, original works. Personally, I don't really do that, <laughs> but in case... Uh, and also, it's nice to know that your work won't, won't look different in uh, 50 years or whatever. And this yellow ochre could easily be compared to the one next to it on the sheet, number 231, which is gold ochre, which is just PY43, which I believe is just the um, natural version of this yellow pigment and you can see it's a little lower tinting I would probably say a little um, more transparent and it apparently is granulating so maybe this would add some interesting textures to like a landscape painting or something like that 
I have to excuse like the little shadows. I'm still figuring out this filming setup, but I think this works fine. I always think it looks bad, but then I go to edit the video and I think, nah, that's fine. <laughs> it's not as bad as I thought. This is really nice. The watercolor paper I'm swatching on today is uh, just student grade um, cellulose paper. So nothing special, but I think that it does show granulation if there is some, and I think I can see a little bit of texture coming through here. I'm moving the paper around so you don't get the glare from my uh, desk lamp. And the next color is number 265, which is transparent oxide yellow. And the dot for this one was quite small, but I think we'll get an impression of the color. It seems like a lot more brown. It's just a PY42, but obviously not the same PY42 that they used in the, in the yellow ochre, I expect, because it looks very, very different. It is very transparent, that much is true. It's also a bit more brownish, um, not as yellow. I'll just show you on here you see there was like not very much pigment on this dot but there is enough I think to get the general impression I appreciate actually that Rembrandt they put their dots on this sort of plasticized uh, paper so quite often dot charts come on watercolor paper um, with the intention that you'll swatch them on that paper but Rembrandt seems to have made it so that it's easy to get every single last bit of the paint off of the dot chart so you can actually use it in test paintings or just swatching them out for yourself on your own paper which i think is really revolutionary to be honest this is a nice color i wouldn't choose it i would probably choose the yellow ochre out of these three um but i think it's very nice maybe if you paint a lot of wildlife moving on to number 234 which is their raw sienna and this one is PY43, again, much like the gold ochre, but um, just a different shade, very transparent, and they say that this one is granulating as well. I've got a bunch of water stock on my brush ferrule. I'm terrible at that. I don't know how to prevent that. If you have like a, if you're a water, water control uh, professional and you happen to be watching this video, please do let me know <laughs> how one is supposed to handle that because, um, that's one which I am constantly battling with. You know, I, I do paint quite a bit with my watercolours, and so, like, I have a good, fairly good handling of the basics, but that one, I always struggle. Yeah, so this one doesn't get super deep in the mass tone, as far as I can tell. You can see I'm sort of just pushing the pigment around. It's very transparent. I just left off a little bit here. I'll stop fussing with it. But it's a really nice shade. You can see it's this like lovely bright golden uh, yellow compared to the transparent yellow oxide, for example. Um, but I will definitely come back here at the end and show you them all when they're dry. So up next is Quinacridone Orange, our beloved. A rest in peace, PO48. This is PO48, Quinacridone Burnt Orange. And it is just a really stunning, like vivid burnt sienna kind of colour. I wonder if, still, if they still have stock of this, because I might pick up a tube just to have a tube of PO48, because this is a really lovely version, really bright, really saturated, really transparent. Uh, yeah, they discontinued this pigment a couple years ago, and everyone was very sad about it, because it's a really lovely single pigment orange like this. I, I mean, it's definitely more on the brown side, but... Really lovely for mixing greens, really natural greens. And then we can compare this with the colour next to it, which is Transparent Oxide Red. We'll see whether this is more reddish. Rewetting like an absolute dream. I've been so impressed with these paints and how they rewet. And this one is really nice. I would use this maybe in place of a burnt sienna kind of colour because I prefer more um, saturated browns on the whole. Though recently, and you guys are going to think I'm crazy because for the last year on this channel, I've been saying about how I don't like raw umber or greenish brown, but I've been really getting a craving for that earthy, muted green colour. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I don't know myself, but this is a really nice colour. I would buy this. Uh, absolutely. Very similar though to the burnt orange next to it. So if you wanted a colour that would mix similarly, I bet this one would. And then we can compare this to their Burnt Sienna, which is a natural Burnt Sienna, a PBR7. They say it's transparent, but I would say on the dot chart, as I'm re-wetting it, 
it looks a little bit more opaque but yeah as you can see it's still a, on the warmer side of brown but it feels like more like a natural brown not it doesn't have this glowing effect that these two have uh, do they say it's granulating no they say it's not granulating it's just a smooth burnt sienna I don't, I don't know what i feel like this color looks like i'm not sure if it looks like a burnt sienna to me i feel like burnt sienna to me is a little bit more uh saturated and reddish than this but i'm sure this is a very nice brown a very natural brown again um for painting trees or animals would probably be really nice I realise that the, the swatches are a little, they look a little patchy like this, but they do tend to even out when they dry. It's just a combination of the paper and the fact that I'm using a brush, which is quite small. Um, so you don't get like the nice swooshing effect because you're trying to work in a small space. But yes, like I say, we'll see when they're dry. This olive green, by the way, really growing on me as it dries. Really nice colour. Number 409, Burnt Umber. So I'm expecting this to be a darker yet still warm brown another pbr7 pigment that's a just an iron oxide brown iron oxide can represent many different colors be processed in many different ways and as you can see this one is really nice like i said a darker warm brown just wash it out a little bit so we can see what it's like in the in a wash um i'm painting over the numbers here so you can see how transparent it is um and I think that most of these paints are very transparent, at least in the in the wash. So that's very nice. I've been really impressed with the quality of these paints. And they're so affordable as well where I am <laughs> in Europe. Um, they're one of the cheapest uh, artist quality brands. And I think they're honestly underrated. I, I really like this Burnt Umber colour. I think I prefer it to the Burnt Sienna. I would probably go for a pairing of this one and this one for my browns. And up next is that colour that I was saying that I hated for so long, greenish umber. So like a really, I don't know, like a poopy brown <laughs> kind of colour. And I don't know, I feel like for so long I, I really was convinced that I hated these raw umber kind of clay brown colours. But recently I've just been craving it. I've been craving how they mix to make these sort of like lovely muted green tones and how they make other colors pop next to them so maybe i need to eat my words and maybe we'll do a do a video compa comparing this is pbr8 which is a different pigment i'm not sure if that's like a manganese brown or something apparently it's granulating so we'll see when it dries i did add a fair bit of water and it re-wet really beautifully sometimes these natural umber colors they can be a little tough to re-wet but this one is absolutely not, so highly recommend for that. And then we have a colour which is very interesting to me. They're calling it Transparent Oxide Umber. It is a mixture of PY42, so the synthetic yellow iron oxide, PR101, synthetic red iron oxide, and PBK11, which is Mars Black. And is nice. I'm not sure if this is like... <laughs> If this has an advantage, I guess it's like a a cooler brown that is not the greenish one. But I'm it's interesting that they chose to use a three pigment mix rather than just to find a single pigment, like a version of PBR7 that would probably look like this. But it is very transparent. It's very nice to rewet. It's very nice to use. So if this is a colour that you feel like would fill a gap in your palette, then let me know in the comments because... I'm always uh, intrigued, especially with earth tones. I feel like when I got into watercolours, it's easy to be drawn to the super vibrant, saturated tones, but I didn't really know what I was doing with the earth tones, and I'm really only just coming into that now. Up next is sepia, and this looks absolutely nuts on the dot chart, by the way. Look how black that is. It's so deep. PBK7 and PR101, so I'm expecting this to be an incredibly dark brown. Oh my goodness, that is wonderful. They say it's transparent, and I think in a wash it probably is. It's just incredibly pigmented. That was really the tiniest dab of water that I added to that dot. I don't know what it is recently. <clears throat> I've been losing my voice a lot when recording videos. It's very annoying. Yeah, this is a really, really beautiful colour. 
I, I like the sepia. It's very cool. I feel like some sepias I've seen have been a little bit, sorry, yes, this is very cool. I, some of the sepias I've seen have been on the more reddish side. This is not so much on the reddish side. And then we have Van Dyke Brown, number 403, and this is PR101 and PBK7, so the same pair of pigments, just the other way around. And again, it, it's incredibly intense. I'm going to try and wash this one out a little bit more evenly than the other one, now that I know that that's what I'm dealing with. This, I, I mean, I can't believe how pigmented these paints are. They are such high quality, but this is a much more greyish... Uh, tone somehow. I don't know, they must have used a different version of the PR101 for this mixture. Um, but still, they say it's only semi-transparent, so maybe it was a more opaque PR101. 403, if you can't read that number anymore, so maybe you will be able to when it's dry. Very interesting. Very, very deep brown. Very natural. I like that one. I think that you'd probably pick either the sepia, which is drying more reddish now that I see it actually, or this one uh, for your palette. And then they have a very interesting color, Spinel Gray, PBK 26. I do not know what to expect from this. Is that like a cobalt black? I think it might be a cobalt black. They say it, it, it's a high series color. It's a series three color, which makes me think that it might be a cobalt pigment. It's a very cool, like, black <laughs> effectively like a blue toned uh, black and it's very nice I'm not sure I mean maybe if you use a lot of black you would have more informed opinions on this one but I'm not sure why when some of the other black pigments are so much cheaper you would go specifically for this one apart from maybe if like me you're a little bit of a pigment collector <laughs> and this pigment interests you because it's probably one of the cheaper versions of this pigment in that case Looks very nice anyway, incredibly intense, great quality, uh, great quality paint. We'll see what it looks like uh, when it dries. So we're into the other sort of greys and blacks now, we're through with the earth tones. And this one is neutral tint, which is PBK6 and PV19. Neutral tints are often a sort of violet or blue toned black mixture. Um, Personally, I prefer the ones which don't contain black, so they're just like a pre-mixed uh, neutral colour um, with like three primaries or something. I like the Roman Schmoll Shadow Grey for that as well, though it is a bit more blue-leaning. Um, but some people prefer to mix with this rather than a pure black, though as far as I'm concerned, if the primary pigment is black anyway, then <laughs> maybe it's kind of a bit moot, but um, you know, there's a paint colour for everybody, there's no such thing as a wrong choice for your palette, unless you have like a specific aim in mind, I suppose, and then maybe there is, but I'm not informed enough to talk about that. And then we can compare that with their Payne's Grey, which is PBK6 and PB15, so that's a phthalo blue, they don't say which kind, incredibly pigmented. <laughs> these pigments, this, these paints are nuts, they just re-wet so easily and are so intense, possibly the most intense I've ever seen on a dot chart which is saying something because I swatched the Schmincke and the Daniel Smith ones as well before I had a YouTube channel. This is a nice Payne's Grey. It's definitely more black than blue. Um, some Payne's Greys almost would compete with an indigo. This one is definitely on the grey side. I would be more inclined to choose this than the neutral tint, but I honestly would be more inclined to choose an indigo over either. Because um, I think if you mix an indigo with like a dark brown, like one of these sepia colours, you end up with a really, really nice, interesting neutral. But I think if you, depending on your purposes, if you'd rather have a more violet leaning or a more uh, blue leaning neutral, you can have those at your disposal. And then we have Davies Grey. So Davies Grey in a lot of other brands includes white. <laughs> and it's usually a sort of greenish leaning uh, grey or or like a, a pastel colour. And this is just PBK11, so Mars Black, and PBR7, and I would bet that it's a greenish umber, like that. So it's it's transparent, which is interesting, and I guess maybe it's a little uh, bit harder to re-wet, so maybe it's meant to be used more washed out, like this, for like a proper grey 
kind of colour and it is greenish leaning though it looks just like a little bit like muddy water to me. I think <laughs> probably if you just did like a whole painting and then just used your uh, your paint water it probably look a bit like this which is a little bit offensive I'm sorry if you really like the colour but to me it feels like um, something that would be very easy to just mix. I heard a lot of uh, artists use their, their palette mud, so basically all the colours that sit on their palette, they mix them all up together and use them to neutralise their brighter, more primary colours, and I think this is sort of like a pre-made uh, palette mud, but it's just got two pigments. Um, and then we have Oxide Black, which is PVK11, Mars Black, Granulating Black, used a lot in special effect colours for that purpose. I have this pigment in the Roman Schmoll um, Aquarius Black, which is one of the most granulating paints I've ever used. Um, so we'll see what this one looks like. I will add a little bit of extra water so we can uh, see if it really is granulating nicely. That was a 735, yes. <laughs> I'm always terrified of messing up these numbers because I write them on the sheet, obviously, before I do the swatching and then sometimes I get carried away. So yeah, let's just pull out a little bit of this pigment out of the corner, leave a little puddle of water and see how it sits. Though I think I can see already that that is granulating very nicely. And then we have 701, which is ivory black, PBK9. And I have a hunch this will be a bit of a warmer black, maybe. I did a whole video um, about mixing with black paints. You can find that in the colour mixing playlist on my, on my channel. Because a lot of uh, watercolour advice will tell you that you should not mix with black watercolours and I think that there is a time and a place <laughs> for that advice and people should try it and come to their own conclusions but I, 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 I think I prefer to not mix with black that's been my like conclusion myself but I do think that I hate the rhetoric that it's a universal rule yeah, but this looks like a very nice nice black. A little on the warmer side, but nothing too crazy. This granulation is going to be magical. And then we're on to the final row of the sort of normal colours, let's say. We have lamp black. So this is PBK6. Uh, like a carbon black. I expect it will be... They used to make this from the residue from oil lamps. So we really like the soot that used to be produced. And I think it will be a more blue-black. These pigments are so crazy. There's so much pigment in these dots. I keep picking up too much and then not being able to see it in the wash. Which is a wonderful problem to have. Because nothing worse than a watercolour that is not pigmented enough. Just hope that it means that my swatches look okay at the end. I have these black strips on my paper, if you're wondering why. For the uh, like s uh, metallic and special effects colours that are coming up after these. So this is the cooler the cooler of the two with the lamp black over here being a bit warmer and this one is a little bit more on the blue side. And then we have 840 which is graphite and I was wondering if I should have swatched this also on the um, black paper but chose not to. It is apparently coated mica so I know some brands um, Rembrandt and also not Rembrandt, uh, Roman Schmoll and Schmincke have actual graphite uh, watercolours. I can't remember what the pigment code is now. PBK10 or something? No, that's peach black. Anyway, they have actual graphite, um, whereas Rembrandt seems to use some sort of like gunmetal silver kind of colour, basically. So you get really get that. It looks really metallic on the dot. It re-wet quite nicely. Sometimes metallic colours can be a little bit fussy to work with like that, but this one looks very nice. I mean, I guess we'll see when it's dry whether it sort of really gives that graphite pencil effect. Um, I also really enjoy using just generally water-soluble graphite. I really like the art graph one that comes in a tin. Um, I've done a video using that before, but it's always interesting to experiment with other options. And then for the final three non-special effects colours, though I guess they are in a way, we have some of these very famous paints from from this brand which are their dusk colors so starting with dusk yellow so it's a mixture of py 128 um with pbk 11 the mars black so the idea is that you have this transparent color that you've mixed with the pbk 11 and then 
when you paint it on the page, it sort of granulates and the black separates out and it looks really pretty. Um, so there's the green, pink and yellow versions. And we'll see. I mean, obviously it looks kind of a bit greenish uh, coming off of the dot, this one, because it's a black mixed with a yellow, which tends to make these sort of nice natural greens. But we'll have to wait for these ones to dry to really get the full effect. You can already see them separating. But I have a feeling that maybe they look a little bit less muddy when they're done. The dusk pink is separating <laughs> on the in the water that I added onto it into the, the pink was coming out in the in the water and it looked very pretty. I think this one will be a nice muted sort of violet when it's sort of more uniform and then we'll have to add some water and see. So it's a mixture between PR122, which is a quinacridone uh, rose and PBK11 as always. So that's this granulating black that's directly above this one on the, on the swatch sheet. I don't tend to use uh, these sort of mixtures with um, with black very much, but I know some people are really into creating these lovely, moody uh, illustrations or paintings, and then these colours can be absolutely wonderful. And then this last one is um, Dusk Green, which is PBK11 and PG7, so phthalo green, blue shade. And you can already see this is like a really nice foresty green, almost like a perylene green kind of colour, which I don't think... Rembrandt has in their line, which is a shame because it's one of my favourites. And let's see if we can make it, give it lots of water, lots of space to move. Granulating colours need a bit of freedom to show their best selves, much like human beings. <laughs> Getting a bit deep for a Sunday morning, but uh, <laughs> these videos do tend in, turn into a bit of a ramble. It's not for everybody for sure. But this colour I think is my favourite one uh, overall, just in the just in the colour of it. But I do like greens most. This yellow is really separating out and looking a lot less muddy now. So now we move on to the special effects colours. I have some clean water here. I figured, I, I, I thought ahead and uh, realised that I was going to need clean water to experiment with these because they are shiny. So we have some stereotypical uh, trans... Uh, not transparent, metallic colours, and then we also have some extra special effects colours, and these can be a little bit hit and miss. So I decided I'm going to do like a little swatch on the on the black and a little swatch on the white, so you won't get so much of like a gradient wash, but it will be just an indication of uh, what the paint looks like. And we will see how well they re-wet, because I don't have a great experience with um, metallic watercolours, though I have added the water onto these in advance to try and get the most out of it. And the first one is silver. So we'll swatch it on the black, so you can see it there. I mean, obviously these are going to be best shown afterwards, so maybe I'll just go through them kind of quickly and then spend more time on them later. But it, it feels like a very transparent, uh, very transparent warm silver. I don't know, maybe my brush is a little dirty still or something, but it feels like a very finely milled uh, coated mica. These are these are all coated mica. These particular um, metallic colours. So it's not like a I don't know. Very interesting. We'll see what it looks like when it dries. But it's certainly rewetting enough to get like a actual impression of the colour, which is always a good start. And then up next we have gold. And this one is also coming off the dot card quite nicely. Very yellow, true gold. I like that. And then let's see what it looks like on the white. So again, you can see it almost feels like a, almost looks like a yellow ochre or something. I kind of had this idea in my head when I was looking at these earlier. I was like, I wonder what it, I wonder what it's like if you mix these special effect colors with regular paints. Like if you mix like these. Not necessarily the metallic ones, but the like interference colours and colour shifting colours with regular paints, like what happens? I've never tried that because I've never owned any, but maybe I will now. Oh, and then the final one is copper, which has been the easiest to rewet by far off of the dot chart. And is also probably my favourite metallic tone. Like if I was going to buy one, this would probably be it. But we'll see how metallic it looks when it's dried. 
but I was very impressed with the re-wetting on that one. It certainly feels like the most pigmented, though the silver, I think, was potentially misleading. Because, yeah. But this is lovely, lovely colour. Really nice, really nice copper colour. Out of those three, this is the one that I would choose. But actually, even when I was a kid, I think copper was my favourite metallic colour. So that's maybe not surprising. And then we're moving on to number 843, which is Interference White. Uh, it, it's coated mica again. I really have no idea what to expect from this. Like, absolutely no idea. I expect it doesn't show up at all on the white on the white paper. But you can see here, it has this sort of like iridescent... It looks vaguely iridescent or pearlescent on the, on the black paper. Just, just want to see what they look like when they dry. I mean, I know some people use these special effect colours as like glazes. So you do your your watercolour painting and then you put a little bit of this over the top of the some areas of the painting. So you get that um, impression of it being shiny when you move the paper around. I've never tried that. Let me know in the comments if that's something you do regularly. And then we have Interference of Violet, which does look a little violety on the dot chart. It's always hard to know how much paint you're picking up. Oh wow. Ooh. That's the first one that's really impressive. That really looks that really looks purple on the black. I wonder if you mix it in with a black paint. Does it does it give the same like effect? Because like you see it on the white. You can't see anything at all. It's almost like I didn't pick up any paint. You can't see it at all until it's on the black. Very interesting. I haven't done too much uh painting on black paper but that's very intriguing indeed i'm gonna I, i'll do i'll like when i show these at the end i'll tilt the paper around so you can see them uh, clearly and then we have interference blue again these are all coated mica wow it looks like i think it just looks like milk <laughs> to you probably but to me i can see from an angle that this is a really interesting blue color I don't know how to show this maybe if I pick up the paper you can see how it's quite a bright blue honestly but then on the white paper it just looks like nothing at all crazy oh that's that's wild I'm so glad this is this is the advantage of getting dot charts because I would never risk buying a tube of these like right off the bat but <laughs> it certainly is interesting to see what they look like just when you have a little tiny sampler and then we have Interference Green, which looks like a very minty green right now on the black paper. And then, as usual, oops, nothing on the white paper. Uh, this this uh, black paper, by the way, is not watercolour paper. It's just black cardstock, really. But I uh, just needed something to show a metallic effect. So I figured it would be good enough for these purposes. And then we have on to these chameleon colours, which are coated glass instead of coated mica. And it's, so I guess they will have like a duochrome effect. And the first one is chameleon gold red violet, supposedly. And I can see, maybe you can see too, little sparkly like glitter on my brush. And let's see what this looks like. This looks like it's literally a glitter paint. I guess that's what kind of glitter is to be honest coated glass these are quite high series colors like quite expensive i think so um definitely a commitment but maybe if you get the dot chart and then just try them out you could decide if you would use them on the white paper you can see that there is glitter you can't see this glitter i can see this glitter these ones are going to be hard to show on camera i can already tell I'll show you at the end, maybe I can turn the light up so you can really, so it will reflect off of all of the little glittery part particles. This one looks mostly violet to me from this angle. I'm sort of like moving my head around to try and see, but I guess we'll wait till it's dried. So that was gold red violet, and this one is red violet blue. The only way I can tell if I've picked up any of this paint at all really is by looking on the brush. <laughs> looks quite pretty. Okay. Oh, wow. Ooh. I love warm blues and this is giving me big warm blue vibes. This is so unimpressive on camera. Thank you for sticking with me. I promise that, that there will be something to show for this all at the end. And uh, hopefully this is at least interesting to see 
the difference. Like it really looks like nothing. So this would be amazing as a glaze, like over the top. Because you really can't see it at all on the white paper. So it's entirely transparent. And then we have a violet, blue and green. So I'm guessing it's they, they mean it, it's either a mixture of those colours or it shifts between those colours. I do wonder if the coated glass would have an effect if you were using your fancy brushes. Maybe not. So this is this is blue, violet, blue, green. So the last one was, wow. <laughs> this is such a sparkly, oh, not even focused, but yeah, sparkly turquoise colour. When it's wet anyway. I can feel like they feel gritty from the dot card. You can really tell that it's coated, coated glass. I wonder if they have these in the Van Gogh colours because I would maybe pick up one to try and just do some mixing with it. And my water is starting to look like fairy dust. Maybe see the, the, swir the swirling uh, mica and glass in there. It's kind of crazy. And then the final one is Chameleon Blue Green Gold, which sounds very interesting to me. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's like a lime green from this angle that I'm sitting at. I'm expecting that the angle changes quite a lot. Very dense with the pigments. This one re-wet quite nicely, though it was also sitting the longest, of course. And then... Let's see, you can really even see the glitter on the white paper from where I'm sitting. Maybe also a little bit on the camera. Though it looks yellower on the camera, maybe that's like that effect. And this looks more green from where I'm sitting. Either way, not incredibly impressive, <laughs> I guess, while it's wet. And then finally, <clears throat> we have these colours that they're calling spark colours, which are also coated glass. And the first one, I have no idea what to expect from these, like absolutely no idea. But this one is spark green and it looks honestly like the others though the particle size is maybe a little smaller oh okay again i just really have no idea what i would uh i'm just really no idea what to expect from these this looks like a sort of turquoisey green though it's really like nothing on the white paper so they're really like just for special effects I want to also wonder if they would look different on black watercolour paper. Maybe I'll do some testing. And then we have Spark Blue, which I'm incredibly hopeful for because the blue ones do tend to be to my taste. I can't tell if I've rewetted at all. I have. I, I have, indeed. <laughs> this is so crazy. It's like a, you can't even tell if you've got it on your brush. But this looks really magical. On the black paper, I'm glad I set that up because otherwise this would be an incredibly disappointing swatching session. And it just looks like plain water. <laughs> On, but you can tell there's like when you're painting with it, you can tell it's not just plain water because you can feel like the binder uh, in your brush. You can see the difference there between those two colours. And then we have Spark Violet, which I I don't even know what I don't even know what to make of these anymore. Let's see. Okay, so this one. It feels a little <laughs> less impressive. I don't know. I think that the dot that I have on my dot chart was quite binder heavy. I'm going to see if I can get a little bit more of the the spark out of it. Yeah, kind of. But this is the less, least impressive of the spark colours so far. This would be great if you're painting, if you like to paint galaxies or something, maybe this would be a really nice effect. Or again, if you paint a lot on black paper, not really my thing. This really doesn't look like anything on camera, I'm so sorry. You can see, kind of, when I tilt it, the, the purple coming through, all of those. These uh, chameleon colours look particularly impressive. And then the final one is Spark Pink. So let's see if this one has... I can see this. I can see the... Uh, the pinkness in this one already. Okay, yeah, that one is much more impressive than the violet. I think I might just have a bad swatch of the violet. I'm sure if you buy it in a tube, you get more sparkliness out of it. But this is a really nice pink colour. Actually, uh, more on the red side, which is my preferred sort of tone of pink. 
So I guess these are really exciting. I can't wait to see what these look like when they are fully dried and we can see their sort of final forms. I'm going to let all of these dry and then come back with you later and give you a little overview. Okay, so we are back, the final swatching session for this dot chart. And they are mostly dry, just a couple of the ones at the bottom are still a little bit wet, but I think that we can still see the effect. As you can see, they have a really nice selection of earth tones. I think they cover all the basic uh, sort of options, though I, I do think the other ranges, other brands, have a more comprehensive range of options for earth tones. Um, I know Daniel Smith have really like a an absolute confusion of them. Although I think that if you're just looking for a starting uh, set, then you could easily find all of the mixing colours that you need from this range. One thing I did notice with Rembrandt is that sometimes, with just some colours, the mass tone can be a little shiny. It's dry right now, but it can be a little... I mean, nothing crazy. Like, nothing to indicate uh, what I would describe as an issue with the quality of the paint or whatever, just something that I noticed. These uh, are the last sort of couple of the green colours. I think their version of green gold is really beautiful. This olive green might suit some people who paint a lot of natural subjects. And then you can pick your yellow earth. I think that the yellow iron oxide, transparent yellow iron oxide, is the sort of weakest candidate out of these. I think that one of these, uh, yellow ochre or the gold ochre, would be really good choices. Um, they have like so many shades of black and grey. This Davies grey, I still don't really understand. The neutral tint and the Payne's grey actually have some interesting texture in, which I was not expecting because I think that the paint itself... Hang on, what are they mixed with? The Payne's grey is PBK6, which is the lamp black, which is this one. Um, this one doesn't really have texture, so I'm not really sure why these do. But, I mean, it's not like a bad thing. They're quite nice colours. I, I Personally, I don't use a lot of black. This is one of the most intense blacks I've seen, this uh, spinel grey. I think it's a really lovely pigment um, if you're into or you use a lot of very intense darks. Uh, and obviously the uh, PBK11 is very granulating. Uh, you can see the pattern of granulation there feels very natural. And as a result, these dusk colours with the yellow, pink and green are widely beloved. I think they're really nice. I personally wouldn't use them that much, but I think that a lot of people really find them very attractive. The graphite, you can see, is shiny, like a pencil. Um, I think I would probably still prefer to use a water-soluble graphite than this mica uh, version, but, you know, maybe if this is a colour that you think you would use, then let me know what you create with it in the comments below. And then we come to the specialty colours. So these metallic colours, I think I may have done them an injustice when they were wet because they are very nice and shiny now on uh, the black and the white paper. Um, the silver may be the weakest of them, but that's, I think, usually the case. But on the black, you can really see it. And I think this copper is absolutely stunning. These are the interference colours then, these four. Uh, white, uh, violet. Yep, blue and green. Um, and you can see they really are like a pearlescent kind of colour. Um, I think that the green is probably the most effective on the white paper as well as the black, but I think that they would be wonderful glazers to just adding a little bit of pearly sheen. And then we are on to the chameleon colours. So these are really lovely. I'm not seeing a lot of colour shift. I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe, maybe in the blue purple here, like when I tilt it, you see a bit more purple. Um, but nothing too dramatic, but maybe that's nice. Like, it's a very subtle effect. If you were painting like a dragon, putting some of these on the scales, especially this, like, blue-green-gold one, would be very fancy indeed. And then finally, these spark colours. Again, I think that maybe I didn't... My my purple dot was a bit um, binder-heavy, so you don't see the effect so much. But the others are really lovely, and I also really like the effect on the white paper, actually. It's so hard to show these on camera. <laughs> I have to understand I'm doing my best. You can see they're very glittery. I, I think that they're really nice, actually. I think I like the I like this green one a lot, actually. So I was pleasantly surprised by these, to be honest. This is not usually the range of colours that is my favourite in any watercolour brand, but actually these metallics and the special um, effects colours may be. This was helpful for somebody who was a little bit uh, unsure about what the deal was with uh, colours like these and maybe helped you choose. If you... 
did enjoy the video then do give it a like let me know in the comments um which of these colors you were surprised by or any that you have already and you love or how you use them and i will see you all with another video in the next couple of weeks bye everybody